Yeah. Uh... Uh, in the Unknown Pleasures series of screenings that are coming up uh, this year, um, there is a special event coming up at the Thornbury Picture House on Tuesday uh, at 8.30, and that's uh, a selection of films uh, and other um, installations, whatever you'd like to call them, from David Cox, who's been based in the US for a while. He's now back in Australia. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to David Cox right now. David, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you. Great, great to be here. Happy to be here. Great to talk to you. And I read uh, a quote from you that says, my work re revolves around technology and identity. Can you talk, uh, elaborate on that and talk more about what drives the sorts of films and other work that you do? Sure. Yeah. Um, I come from a family of engineers uh, in England and my grandfather was an electrical engineer. Uh, my father was a photographer and a freelance photographer and most of my family are involved in media of some kind. So I, I come from, you know, an industrial part of Great Britain and I grew up in the 60s when in the post-war years there was a, a lot of uh, industry around me and uh, I was steeped in the whole sort of post-war European sense of technology being central to you know, what the world was about. So like most kids of the uh, uh, that period, you know, you were very conscious of, of technology, particularly heavy and, you know, machinery, uh, uh, industry, design, uh, you know. So being in Birmingham and then later moving to California, you know, the, the sense of the future being linked to technology in one way or the other, uh, was heavily imprinted. So, and also the ambivalences about technology, you know, like the C and D movement in Britain, the kind of uh, issues about the Vietnam War in America and how heavily technological that was, uh, so the rise of cybernetics, um, all of these things were around me growing up. And so by the time I, I entered film school, I was already ready to say something about this complex ambivalence uh, antipathy but also fascination with machines and humans and cyber culture and all the rest and uh you know i was simply being a 20th century subject i guess fair enough too and that's quite a, a great description there now the the evening uh screening will be broken up into four uh categories or four stages and i'm interested in in, in each one but let's talk about your first one super eight because that that was a, a major grounding for you, I suppose. Yeah, well, you know, um, in the 80s, if you wanted to make anything that uh, people would see, uh, you had to uh, get together with other people and arrange the screenings. It, the distribution then as now was the real bottleneck. Uh, it, you could make films, uh, but it was getting them actually seen, uh, which is the restriction. Distributors have always had the stranglehold on getting things out there. And so the, the, the method we used, and it was an extension of the methods used in the 60s with the film co-ops and so on from London and, uh, the, you know, uh, Jonas Mikas in New York. And we our equivalent, I guess, was the Cantrells in Melbourne. But, you know, our instinct was to group together and form coalitions and extend these coalitions to become uh, co-ops. So the, the Melbourne Super 8 film group, for example, was you know upwards of 60 or 70 people who gathered on a regular basis to show films. And you know, I'd already gone to film school at Ruston Film School, and I understood the importance of collective screenings and collective film production. And that's very much the tradition I came out of. And the relationship between um, uh, collective filmmaking, collective film screenings, and the sense of uh, needing to group together to overcome the bottlenecks was very prevalent, not only in the way uh, the films were made, but also in the way they were uh, shown and the way they were thought of. And, you know, our distribution systems were self-generated and self-encouraged and now you know our we had our own magazines our own publications Cantrell's film notes film news uh, Melbourne Super 8 film group newsletter and it was kind of self-supporting 
Uh, of course, it all changed in the 90s with the internet. But by that time, I'd moved to different media anyway. But Super 8 itself is, uh, was a medium that was associated largely with amateur production. But, you know, uh, we treated it as a legitimate form and, uh, you know, just basically uh, tried to break break the rules where we could. Other people tried to fit in as much as they could. There were conformist filmmakers, anti-conformist filmmakers. Very dynamic time. I, I, I look back very fondly on those days, you know. And Bill Masoulis, of course, was at the was 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 uh, running the show, and without him, none of it could have happened. Exactly right. <laughs> How interesting. <laughs> Now, I, I'm uh, Pappenhead is probably one of my favourite uh, short films of yours, and uh, uh, and it features John Flowers. And it, it, the Germanic influence, of course, is very strong in that film. Tell me about how that all came about. Well, I had uh, got, I'd, I'd been working for the education department uh, in a language centre in Footscray, and I'd, I'd worked or Maribyrnong. I worked there for quite a while, and you know, I I sort of. Um, I felt that that job had run its course. So I, I, I basically quit. I quit the education department and took all my retirement money and with a friend went to Europe uh, on, and got a URL pass and said, look, you know, I'm ready for a big experience now. So, you know, we, we got a URL pass. We went to all these different countries and did what you do if you can, when you're young and you, uh, you do the grand tour, you know, and, uh, one of the stops had been Germany and Berlin, and uh, I felt I had to pay my respects uh, at the death camps. I went to Dachau and, you know, was profoundly moved by the sheer scale of Dachau. And, you know, I hadn't understood just how vast those places were. And then, of course, when you're there, you're reminded that it was simply one of hundreds and hundreds of similar Things and you, you just wake up to the sheer scale of what happened during World War Two, and as it happens, when we're uh, you know in Berlin, I, I like a lot of tourists. I got you know some East German marks and went through Checkpoint Charlie and had a look around. You know that plus the experience of walking around East Berlin, you know, really rammed home just what had happened after World War Two that the Russians had come in, that they'd occupied Eastern Europe, and that they had uh, basically uh, extended the Soviet Union into Germany, half of Germany, and the other, and this small pocket of Western Europe was there in Berlin. And it was really, like, fascinating. But the wall was about to come down, and you could definitely tell, you could definitely tell something was happening. <laughs> um, and so... I had a nightmare. I was at the youth hostel. I had this nightmare about getting chased around a house uh, by this, you know, by this creature that looked like a chess piece. Uh, and, you know, so that nightmare got turned into a short story and the short story got turned into the film that you see. But the theme of, you know, uh, this frenzied kind of technological identity crisis, heads being replaced and so on, came straight out of Berlin in 89. So it's kind of a delayed Weimar uh, experience. Uh, and I wanted it to feel like a Weimar experience because in my mind, it was a Weimar experience. It so that's be. really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but no, it feels yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think, I don't think, I think the issues that Germany faced in the 20s was kind of still with it in a sense in the 80s but in a different way nowhere near as desperate nowhere near as uh but you know there are some you know I think what we're facing now in Europe even uh is akin to what was happening a hundred years ago uh Shlevoj Zizek has compared you know the moment we're in to the period just before World War One for example so uh, you know, this kind of uh, sense of Europe always being on the boil, never settled, always in a period of flux, uh, I think is uh, prescient. And I, I think it's best to think of Europe that way uh, rather than anything static or fixed. It's, it's a cauldron of unsettled scores, you know. 
fair comment. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> now, it, your style of filmmaking is so interesting. Uh, obviously, in Pub and Head, but in other zones, etc., uh, you use stop motion. You use uh, special effects. Of course, in days before CGI has, has now been really well developed. And can you talk about that process? Because using technology mm. the way you did was uh, quite uh, significant at the time. Yeah, well, I'd been I'd been very impressed by the work of the brothers Quay. Uh, seeing their 35 mil stop motion work at the Melbourne Film Festival. And I'd also uh, been impressed with the uh, other short work done at Swinburne, um, uh, which had used uh, bolexes. Bolexes, as you know, can you can override the clutch and slow the film down. And as long as you compensate for exposure, you can, you know, you can have the camera run very slowly. Uh, four to 12 frames a second. And as long as all the actors slow down accordingly, uh, you you know, they move apparently at normal speed, but there's something just not right. So what we did in Puppinhead is to make the actors look like they were kind of animated like the puppets, I got them to move at half speed. And then I filmed them at 12 frames a second. So uh, what you're seeing is actors moving at half speed, but it but played back at full speed so that when you when they are cut intercut with stop motion it's less of a jar and it looks like they're both you can't quite tell what's wrong but that's actually what's happening mm -hmm. uh, and so i you know and a lot of uh, a lot of mid early 20th century film work they don't really care about film speed they can go at any film speed because they they want the effect in fact you know they're more film as effect if you like so I, I, I wanted to go for that. And with animation, you're not bothered with sound, sync sound, so you can disengage sound altogether and add it all later. Kind of like Kung Fu movies or Italian near realists, you just forget sound. As soon as you forget sound, sky's the limit. Mm. So, you know, and I had tried to get into the live action department at Swinburne, but it was almost impossible. So my strategy was, look, I'm just gonna try and get into animation and make a live action film while I'm there. And Brian Robinson, he could see my strategy. He said, look, you've done exactly the right thing. I'm going to let you make a live action film and you can do whatever you want. So Bob's your uncle. Uh, so, And it ended up being like the most successful film that year out of Swinburne. So I, I must have done something right. <laughs> it certainly was. <laughs> So let's talk about then the way you've developed your career because you've uh, you've made a number of other films uh, as well as mm. you've diversified into even opera, which I found really fascinating. Yeah, well, that came out my, that came out of uh, doing some research into the uh, Russian Moon program, uh, which is very little known about if uh, because because it failed because the Russian moon program never got off the ground, literally, um, they did launch a few rockets, but they scrapped it because the Americans got there first. But there had been a plan to actually land Russians on the moon in the 60s. Uh, but it came a cropper, mainly because they couldn't afford to develop a few good rockets. Instead, they built lots of rockets with... 32 engines in the base because they develop small rockets very well you know anyway long story short I, I wrote this opera about the development of the n1 and made it as i tried to make the music as pop music sounded in in the eastern Bloc at the time so if you listen to attempts to do western music in the soviet union in the 70s it's kind of a bit daggy they don't quite get it but i actually quite like that property of bad Eastern Europe copies of Western culture uh, because you you know it's it's you know it's kind of an interesting way that culture gets filtered. So I made the opera as if it's kind of like a forgery like Puppinhead's a forgery. It's like a forgery of something that came out of the 30s that they found in a basement. This is a forgery of something from you know uh, Minsk that somebody uh, put on at the workers' workers hall in Minsk to celebrate, you know. So uh, that's kind of like what it is. It's like somebody found that. And so I'm, yeah, I like to do cultural forgeries uh, for forgotten things that somebody just discovers, you know. That, that's kind of what I, and 
And I just got obsessed with this whole thing about uh, the, the failed Soviet moon program. And, you know, the thing is, if you study it, the people involved in that would care just as much as the Americans about getting to the moon. They cared just as much and as passionately about it, but they were stymied by ludicrous bureaucracy and were sort of screwed over left and right by the people above them. So in terms of bureaucracy, there's no difference between Western and Eastern bureaucracy. They, they are both as obstructionist when it comes to the creatives who are just trying to do the right thing. You know, so that really what Cosmonauts on the Moon is about is the futility of good intentions, <laughs> kind of like the film Chinatown is about that. So there was that, uh, 20 minutes long. Then we did uh, Apollo, which is the American one. And then we did uh, Women in Space. So there are three. And they're all on rocketopera.net if you want to see the recordings. Fascinating stuff. I really enjoyed seeing uh, some of that. It, it was great. So tell me how your American experience, when you lived you lived there for a number of years, um, how did that compare to your Australian experience in terms of your creativity? Well, you know, I, I had the great fortune to live in California as a child. My parents had a, a Fulbright Award, which let them exchange lives with uh, folks in America for one year. And in 69, I, I lived and breathed as in a Californian kid in San Diego. So I had the great fortune of enjoying life in California at a very young age. And then we went back to England and then we came to Australia. Now, when we came to Australia in Melbourne in 1972, that was, of course, the dawn of the Whitlam era. So I'd gone from a kind of utopian Californian sunshine world fraught with conflict because of Vietnam, but also the utopia because it's California, everything's utopian, to Australia at the dawn of its utopian moment uh we lived in St Kilda and you know the the Gough Whitlam uh victory speech ceremony was at the St Kilda Town Hall right next to my school St Kilda Primary so I was and my parents were labor folks so we were completely steeped in the whole Whitlam thing and to me Australia begins with Whitlam I, did, I never knew an Australia before Whitlam and then it just I just saw it sort of decline more and more into neoconservatism. So, so it was like, wow, this is a socialist country. And it just got progressively more conservative the longer I lived here. Uh, and until the I think the, the bottom, the worst it ever got for me was Keith uh, Kennett, Jeffrey Kennett. But uh, not that things were any better in America, but, you know, so uh, creatively, things were very creative in the 70s and 80s as you probably re will remember, because it was Wine and Whitlam. You could get grants, you you know, uh, people like Bert Dealing, our heroes, Bert Dealing and uh, John Hughes mm -hmm. and Nigel Bust. These were our heroes. These are our heroes uh, who made the best films at the time, the most offbeat experimental things. Um, and also the mainstream work, films like Outback, Walkabout, you know, these Alien, alienation films. I love Australian alienation films. Uh, exploitation films like Mad Max, Outback, you know, where the West is this kind of dangerous place. Uh, and most of my films play along with that kind of alienated white boy myth. Um, I think it's okay um, because that's what I felt as a Brit here. I felt alienated. So that's what you do. You make alienated white boy films. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> One of the films I, I found fascinating, and th this reflects your political stance, of course, The Secret History of Brisbane. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and of course, with Joe Bielke Peterson and, uh, and what was going on at the time uh, under his uh, leadership, etc. It's quite incredible. And, and you reveal so much in that film. Yeah, I, I, I'd, uh, I'd applied for a job at Griffith Uni in the Film, Media and Cultural Studies Department after Other Zone and I'd got the job. And went up there to teach film uh, in that department. And uh, I was very conscious that in Brisbane, a lot of people were, it's a little bit like France after May 68. A, a lot of people just wanted to kind of forget it, you know, like, and here, here was, uh, to me, the most interesting thing about Brisbane had been its controversial history. Like in Melbourne in the 70s and 80s, we, you know, 
Brisbane had this reputation as being the most progressive part of Australia because they were confronting Joe. And Joe was giving, you know, he was kind of like the Donald Trump, you know, of Australia at the time. He just, he was very similar, actually, if you think about Trump and mm. Joe. Um, and uh, so to us, the music, Radio Birdman and all this coming out of Brisbane and the you know, the pitch battles they would have over housing, you know, the battle for Bowen Hills, all this, it struck us as, well, we're not doing anything in Melbourne. All the real battles are happening up there in Brisbane. And so by the time I got to Brisbane, I couldn't figure out why no one was still keeping alive the memory of this struggle. Um, or not no one, but it was sort of being played down. That The sense was, look, that was then, this is now, we're trying to get over that. You know, and I felt that was kind of revisionist. And I wanted to say, well, you know, I, I wanted to bring that back. And I th then I thought, well, who am I from Melbourne to sort of. Oh, we've just frozen there for a moment. Have you? Oh. Yeah, keep going, David. Sorry. I was just going to say that um, I think if I'd have made that film now, I might have done more to be more inclusive of the sensitivities of the people to the time rather than just bulldoze them with what I thought. Okay. Bulldozing having a, a double meanings, but there you go. <laughs> I like that. Right. But, I mean, but, but you know, because, you know, there was, uh, I think, you know, I think there's something to be said for kind of, putting history in a box but you know it's it's more the right to say what you have to say rather than what it is you're saying sometimes it's it's not polite to rub, to rub an entire city's nose in its own history if you haven't lived there i think that's more what what i feel about that film now but i think we made a pretty good film Yes, you certainly did. So, in, uh, and I think Dirk is now joining us, um, but I'll just, uh, uh, and Dirk, Dirk De Bruyne, there you are. Good to see you. Hey, God, I, yeah, glad I kind of got her, even though it's like late. I'm very sorry. That's all right. Better late than never. Sorry. You're there. <laughs> well, I've just been talking with David yeah. for a fair bit. Dirk, yeah, you would have. Dirk, tell me about what is it that, you really admire about David's work and about the uh, the way you've curated the uh, screening on Tuesday night. Yeah, thanks, Peter. I, I mean, with the curating is really is something between the two of us. But uh, the thing that I always liked about David is his attitude. You know, which really started with his onus on us, where it's about going out in his mini moke and finding, making connections on the run. Uh, and that was kind of around Melbourne. But also, I think that's the attitude he's had about technology itself, you know, where he sort of moves in from one situation to another, might be a country, it might be a technology, and he goes to work, you know, mischievously, you yeah. know. And it's been a bit like that, put it, putting this project together, you know. Things yeah. keep changing and coming because new things sort of come up, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and... Well, yeah, that's kind of the main, the main thing that interests me. And also there's always been a sort of an outsider part of it that he's sort of coming from a very personal sort of physical base in the way that he goes about his work, you know. And looking back now that he's gone through all these technologies, I, I kind of find it interesting just to help me sort of work through what all these different phases of technology have been and where they're going, you know. So... Uh, David, I, I can use David as a personal way of signposting some of those things, you know? Very and, good. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, I mean, one of the things that, that triggered this for me is last year, when my last year of teaching, all my students were stuck in at home. And so I came up with this idea, well, if everyone's stuck at home around the world, why not get people from around the world to sort of talk to the students, you know? And so David ended up being one of those uh, which worked out well. And the thing that really came out it for me for that was when we showed other zone, you know, to these young students, they got it, you know, 
Yeah. And the, they got it in a way that's really interesting because all those things are very innovative and uh, experimental and stuff. And they're not sort of normally the things that everybody gets, but everybody got that, you know, like 20 years after it was made, you know, or whatever yeah. it was. So yeah. it really uh, made the point that it was very predictive, really, you know. And, uh, you know, that's a real feather in, in David's cap in the fact that he was working out at the cutting edge of shifts in technology what those things would be. Absolutely. Well, my, hope, yep. <laughs> my, hope, my hope now is that that prescience will translate into opportunity uh, so that I can extend that license into something new that is more contemporary, using more of the technology of today and the resources of today and uh, because the themes are the same, I mean, the themes tend to be yeah. more or less the same throughout all the work, which is uh, human agency in the face of restrictive, uh, you know, there's always some somebody getting chased uh, and being made to do something they don't want to do. It's in, you know, it's in other zone. The girl doesn't want to do what her mum wants to do, but she feels coerced. In Pup and Head, he just wants to put on a show and there's a Nazi following him, giving him heat. You know, um, it's always about like, I want to do this creative thing, but I'm being kind of held up by this authoritative figure behind the wall from another dimension, you know, so it's, you know, like this kind of balance or between the two. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, and, and now we can, a lot of the restrictions on actually making things have disappeared but we face this global restriction on distribution. You know, even if we made the greatest film in the world, how would we show it? You know, because uh, Facebook, Google, Twitter, all these guys run everything. Uh, and we're back to square one in a sense. But uh, I, I well, don't care. Yeah, sorry. Gonna... I mean, that's true. But I mean, in a way, when you're saying those things, David, sorry for interrupting. Yeah. But, uh, it's kind of like uh, you're living your life like that, you know. These technologies yeah. are kind of doing that to you, and you work out ways of getting out of them. And I think an important one for you was getting out of Australia at one point, you know. Part, partly, yeah. I mean, my dad was a freelance photographer, and one way he boosted family income, and I learned an awful lot from this, is he would always carry at least two or three cameras on him at all times. So that if ever an opportunity came up to grab a photo, he could just bang, go get it. And he sold pictures to the local paper on a regular basis. And he made decent money doing that. And I, I love that quality of being ready to go at any time. Um, and you're never not in a position to turn an experience into uh, an experience into, um, you know, a record. And I think that's the way to live. There should be no point in one's life that cannot be uh, made into a, a, a photographic record or an audiovisual experience. That's been kind of my guiding principle. Hence carrying a Super 8 camera around, hence carrying three or four. I've got two iPhones, you know, half a dozen cameras. But doesn't everybody do that now, though, David? I mean, in a way, aren't you just saying, aren't you saying that your father kind of uh, predicted the fact that, you know, predicted the iPhone generation in a way, you know? Yeah, but he, he had agency. Most people take pictures and yeah. they just share them. They don't think in terms of it having an influence on directly on one's economy and one's life. And therefore, you know, whether it means... For most people taking a picture, it doesn't translate into an economic outcome, which can make the difference between, you know, yeah. uh, it doesn't affect the shopping when they take a picture. Well, in a way, it's been commodified, hasn't it? Yeah. In uh, fact, most people taking pictures work for someone else when they do it. They don't work for themselves. The profit goes to the social media company. They're taking it and publishing it through. So... Yeah, well, how are you work against that? How are you working against that? Sorry, well, I think I'm. <laughs> that's sorry, we, we, may, we may be digressing from uh, Peter's uh, interview. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> but, yeah. No, I, yeah. I just wanted to ask about animation and stop motion animation, and uh, uh, and the way you've used that in some of your films. It it really is quite distinctive, and especially that sort of experimental notion as well. So that technique. Um, and the way that's evolved over time well, has been quite fascinating. 
yeah it, it it's like it's it's it, it's a discipline it's it takes great discipline to study animation i studied it very seriously for one year at swinburne and it's like being a, a priest or a monk you have to really dedicate yourself to it it's also like martial arts which i've studied um and to do it well to do it with any kind of uh dedication you have to hand yourself over to it uh and it's not for the faint of heart but once you do it and once you study the frame it's really about studying the frame like the note in music the frame in film is as, as is as to film as the note is to music or the the letter is to the it, to writing and and once you understand film as a as a constructed medium frame by frame you you don't you get squeamish about pulling the trigger and letting frames run by because it seems wasteful. Uh, so if you animate films, every single frame is precious. And it, it seems much more important to have the action uh, come out of what you do in a delicate, meaningful, purposeful way, you know, uh, to get the walk cycle right, to have the inertia, you know, the 12 principles of animation flow through a secondary motion all these things, they're very important. If only every filmmaker could study some animation, they'd get a much better sense of the dynamics, kinesis and flow of cinema uh, than if they just thought thought of it as the theater that's recorded. And we were at film school, you know, the, the animation department and the live action people had quite different views about what cameras and lenses were for. And I, 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 you know, and then you get to programming, and if you study programming, which we did do in animation because we were using computers, and I've also been into programming as well, you know, that's similar too. You've got functions, loops, variables, operators, you know, it's a similar world of, of, of breaking things down into components. So it's, it, and, and, you know, if you're doing martial arts, you break things down to punches, kicks, you know, it, you need to think in a more generalized, abstract way uh, in order to do this. So I hope that's a convoluted answer, but I hope it answers your question. It does. And Dirk, I'm sure you'd be interested in responding to that. <laughs> well, I think, you know, uh, David's trajectory sort of responds to that because he's moved in and out of all those things but he's kept his focus on a certain attitude through all that stuff. So, I mean, his, his whole career could be shown as a, a, a as a, an answer to that, uh, you know, the, the fact that these things all really fit together and they can all talk about the same things and that over the periods of technology that David works and has worked, he's worked out ways of doing that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, a lot of the human dimension too, because in order to move through these worlds, you have to uh, really touch base with others of like mind, like Dirk. My, my instinct in the 80s was that Arf Arf and groups like that were closest to the 20th century spirit that we talked about before, the Weimar spirit, the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Dada spirit. And when I saw, you know, Arf Arf and Dirk was part of that, I thought, these are the guys I need to be yeah. peripheral to. I, I, I wasn't, you know, I was really in that network, but I wasn't really part of half half itself. Oh, I, I thought you I, were. I, I had the same sort of feelings about them as you do, David, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, and also, you know, yes, I mean, some of those performances, like when they have these performances and they get all these hammers and stuff and just start beating around the studio during a performance and there's all these rhythms, all these almost constructivist kind of gestures, you know, and to see yeah. that in, in a, a, a gallery somewhere in a, in, a in Melbourne, that was really uh, heartening, you know? Yeah, and that, see, I, I studied art and technology at Rosden, and, you know, if you, if you decide not to go the commercial route, but rather treat yourself as a kind of, you know, art and technology artist that dabbles in commercialism, uh, then you've got a much broader set of paints to work with because mm -hmm. most people who work in the film world assume the commercial route is the only one that's viable. And unfortunately, if you if you once you open that door, it, it, it's not a very flexible world, the commercial world. You know, you have to 
actively fight against the the the, the tendency for things to end up looking exactly the same. Mm-hmm. For things not to look exactly the same, you have to fight very hard for them not to. And when they do look different, there's a lot of pressure for you to make them look the same again. So, you know, you uh, and, and this is true of people I know who have, in America who like Lynn Sachs, you know, she she makes documentaries. And as soon as uh, somebody said, you know, when you do interviews, you should really have the interview subject look a little bit to the right of the camera. She said, why? Why do I have to do that? Well, it's the convention in PBS television to, yeah, I'm not doing that. That's not what I do. You know, so <laughs> things like that. You know what I'm saying? It's like there are these conventions that you're faced with. Uh, that Did you have to fight some of that in other zone? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, sure I did. Yeah. Be- because you write a script. It's a script. You You go to a casting agency and it's a casting agency. You, you hire actors, you know, if you, you go through the standard routine procedures of making movies uh, and it's a convention. It's a, it's a convention as much as, uh, you know, uh, uh, the manufacturing is, of motor vehicles is a convention. You know, that's why cars look the way they do. It, it's an industry uh, that works according to international protocols of, of global commerce. Uh, it's you know so so globalism and neoliberalism tend to make everything look like it's suitable for Netflix or suitable for this or suitable for or Kino Cinema or something. So if you come out of the Super Eight Film Network group or you know I don't know um, uh, Graham Cuts Film Weekend at, you know in in the Dandenongs. They don't know what you're talking about. They never entered that world. They never came out of that world. All they know is what they know. And it's generally something like, uh, you know, what's on at the local repertory or, or, you know, it's like the joke about the fish. The the fish says, uh, uh, oh, the water, one fish says to another, oh, the water's gorgeous today. And the other fish says, what's water? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Love it. Look, we're, I'm rapidly running out of time. I know so I've only got a minute left. So Tuesday night, Dirk will be in conversation with David Cox. Uh, at I'll, the be Thornbury... on time. And I'll be there on time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> at the Thornbury <laughs> Picture House uh, at 8.30 for Unknown Pleasures uh, with David Cox's um, films. Um, yes. And uh, go on, David. Yeah. Oh, just saying I have copies. Copies of Other Zone for sale, 10 bucks ah, if you want to buy one. Excellent. I like the commercial aspect of the screening on Tuesday night. That's great. And I'm sure it'll be a fascinating conversation with uh, so much to be shown uh, on Tuesday night. Uh, David Cox, thanks so much for talking with me. And Dirk de Bruyne, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Hello.